Thank you for coming to the opening of the David Ramsey Map Collection in Second Life. I'm Jason Stoddard, Managing Partner of Strategy at Centric, and I'm here to introduce David. He's been working with maps for 25 years and has assembled one of the largest historical map collections in North America. When David first came to us, he said, I've already digitized 17,000 of my maps at full resolution, and I'm featured in Google Earth. What can we do in virtual worlds that goes beyond this? So we use this question as a guiding principle as we work through tests and technical challenges. I knew we were on the right track when David first stepped into a celestial sphere and said, wow, now this is something I haven't seen before. I hope we've been able to express some of the scope and wonder of a tiny part of David's collection here. Thanks again, David, for working with us to explore the limits of these emerging environments. Without further ado, may I present David Rumsey and his inaugural presentation, Giving Maps a Second Life with Digital Technologies. Welcome to the Rumsey Map Islands. I want to share with you some of my excitement in opening this new virtual map world to the public and to talk about how and why I've collaborated with Centric to build this place in Second Life. This journey started about 10 years ago in my map library in San Francisco, shown here, when I decided that I could give a second life to my old maps by digitizing them and making them available to people over the Internet. My motivation, above all, was to give the maps away digitally again and again and to share with people all the aspect of old maps that makes them so interesting and compelling. All the reasons that I collected them. To accomplish this, I've developed various tools and platforms over the past decade at my free online map library, davidrumsey.com, including now this wonderful place in Second Life. The trajectory that I've followed begins with making the first digital images of my maps in the late 1990s through the development of a digital image library then using Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, to unlock information in the historic maps. Then putting those maps in Google Earth and Google Sky, and now opening this map island in Second Life. I'll show many examples of the unlocking of the rich information that exists in historical maps that can occur with these digital technologies through juxtaposition of images, image overlays, radical image reformatting, image mashups, and image compositing, just to name a few. As these views of my lap map library show, I collected a lot of historical maps, over 150,000 at last count in a period of about 25 years. These paper maps, globes, charts, and atlases are the sources for all the digital images in my online map library and here in Second Life. I was drawn to historical maps because they embody art, science, and history all in one artifact, and their visual history as well and can tell us much about the times in which they were made. My collection covers roughly the period from 1700 to 1925. It includes maps of the entire world with a special focus on maps of North America. These two maps, just shown, Delisle's map of North America, 1700, and on top of it, Bartholomew's map of the United States in three sheets, 1922, shows the two ends of my collecting period. One of the themes I've explored with historical maps is the evolution of mapping technology over this time period and how it relates to our modern day GIS. My first use of digital technology with regard to the collection was creating a database to catalog all the maps. This laid the groundwork for creating a virtual library, though at this stage it did not include images. Then I began, shown here, to make digital images of the maps by scanning them at high resolution. I saw the potential to see things in the scanned maps that I could not see as easily in the original. For example, this map of Lewis and Clark's famous trek across North America, 1814, has a complete remapping of the Missouri River. When we zoom into the map, we can look at the grand detour, they called it this big O circle, uh, by the Tetons of the Burnt Wood, very distinctive feature. Later, two years later, exactly, uh, 1816, John Mellish made the first map of the United States to go from coast to coast. And if you look in the upper left, you can see that he incorporated line for line and river for river pretty much all of the work of Lewis and Clark. When we zoom into the John Mellish map, we see the same 
Great Bend of the Missouri. He changes the names a little bit, but then we can put it side by side with the digital image from Lewis and Clark, and now we can really understand in great detail how one map evolved from another. So this got me very excited. With the advent of the Internet in the mid-1990s, I realized that I could use this growing body of scanned digital images and data to share my collection. So I launched my online map library, shown here, davidrumsey.com, with 2,000 maps in 1999. The site is free for all users. It's a philanthropic activity for me. It changed everything about my work. Suddenly I had thousands of people a day using my online maps and I was the proprietor of a virtual library. DavidRumsey.com is the hub for my content building. We now have over 17,000 maps online and for my experiments with software to view and understand that content. It's highly unlikely that you would ever see these digital maps in their paper forms. These are some examples. They're too rare, they're too far away, they're too fragile. But with high resolution images delivered on the internet from my online map library and now in Second Life, you can explore them at will and get to know them intimately. This is the simplest and first way that maps are reborn digitally and given a second life by providing access to the information they hold. But in their digital reincarnation, these map Im images have even more potential. Their information can be unlocked through the use of various software tools and applications and policies with a resulting amplification of that inherent meaning and allowing it to be used across many different kinds of disciplines. We can see many aspects of the transformation and reuse of historical maps by looking at the journey in my own online map collection of this map image of Globe Gores by Giovanni Cassini made in Rome originally in 1790, and see how it can be transformed by digital technologies. The image was put on the Library of Congress Geography and Map Division website several years ago. Subsequently, I downloaded the images of the Gores shown here. The Library of Congress, to its great credit, by the way, was one of the earliest sites to allow free downloading and reuse of its images. And I experimented with georeferencing the Gores in GIS and using the UTM projection shown here and then transforming the globes from UTM here's six of them in UTM and then another six and then combining all twelve into a geographic or unprojected form then using ESRI's Arc Globe software I was able to wrap the gores into a virtual globe shown here and spin them around. I got very excited about this. I had taken paper globe gores that were meant to be wrapped on wooden or plaster globes and made a virtual globe with them. I was then able to combine it. I'm in GIS. I can add this layer of the world at night by NASA and other layers. This seemed very promising to me, but I wanted to get it out into the public world. So along came Keyhole, the precursor of Google Earth, and I was able to put the image into Keyhole and share it with other Keyhole users. Then when Google Earth came along and bought Keyhole and made a public version of it, I was able to create a public layer in Google Earth and share the image with over 250 million Google Earth users, users worldwide. Finally, but not the end of the chain, here we've put the globes in Second Life and my avatar, Map Darwin, can fly to see it moving across Yosemite Valley from 1883, can look at the globe from the outside, but then lo and behold, can actually fly through the surface and see a whole new version surrounding him on the inside. We created an entirely new digital object here by reversing the globe and wrapping it around a hundred meter space. We've also put an orrery on the inside So this was very exciting to me. Ironically, all this prompted me to add 
these Cassini globe gores in paper form because I still love paper and collect paper. And I found both the terrestrial and the celestial shown here in London. And I put them in my own physical map collection. I also added the celestial globe now to Google Earth. Shown here in Google Earth, the celestial globe wraps the Google Earth terrestrial globe at 64 million meters outside the Earth. And then in January of this year, 2008, we added the celestial globe to the new Google Sky layer shown here, where it's combined with all kinds of different star layers, constellations, and so on. It actually rectified extraordinarily well. And here they are now in Second Life with my avatar, Map Darwin, seated on the orrery device and looking at the globe, watching it from different angles, and so on. This journey of the life and changing use of a map image and its multiple effects shows how things have evolved in the last 10 years. Maps have become digital, including the old analog maps. They're widely shared, reused and reformatted, and experienced in new ways hardly imagined by their creators. I want to talk now a little bit about the evolution of the software tools that I've used in building these online libraries. They started with better display and searching software, such as the Luna imaging software that I use, which is shown here. It's a basic uh, and very flexible tool for handling a large image database. These are thumbnails representing each image with the data record on the left. You can bring multiple images into the Luna image workspace. Five images here. Move them around. Look at them in their uh, proportional size to annotations. This is a map of New York City from 1811. Add links to a subway map, a modern subway map of New York, and zoom in and see details. You can also create presentations and slideshows here within the application and also export them. The new version of the Luna software is exciting to me because it's all about uh, doing everything in the browser you can link to every page. You can do mashups, shown here, where you can share them instantly with a URL or embed them in blogs or courseware or other things. It also has facet faceted browsing and browsing by categories. Once the collection got very large, I began to get worried that people were not able to use serendipity or accident to find things. So we built a more whimsical tool called the Collections Ticker. It's like a stock ticker. It's a separate little window shown here at the bottom. The whole collection in thumbnail view moves across in about eight hours in random order or in alphabetical order. When you find something you like, you click on it. It opens in the Luna database, gives you the zoom in, zoom out, and all of the uh, cataloging information. Early on, we added GIS functions to the online library. This required georeferencing of historical maps. Here's the Lewis and Clark map from 1814 again. Georeferencing it means that we have to twist it and turn it using a desktop application here, ArcMap. And this is the georeferenced version of the Lewis and Clark map. It's now brought into modern geographical space, and we can overlay here various boundaries boundaries and roads and cities and even data layers. Each one of these yellow dots represents a Lewis and Clark's campsite. We then designed tools to look at the same map in a, in a global interface here on ESRI's Arc Globe. Again, desktop. We can see the Lewis and Clark map against the globe. Wrapping the globe, we can spin it, turn it, and get a whole other way of looking at it. Combine it with that same Earth at Night NASA layer, and we can see how the area they explored has settled up amazingly over 200 years. We brought all this online using SRI's Arc Map. We designed special viewers in Java, the Quad Viewer and the Image Viewer. 
Here's a, a map service we built on San Francisco with different historic maps from San Francisco. This is the 1890 map of San Francisco in the application. Here's the 1869, the 59, and the 1915. Opening all these maps, which are vastly different sizes, in the quad view, we now see them same size, same scale, same orientation. We zoom in and we can look at four different time periods in San Francisco's history and see changes here along the waterfront. We can change the windows to go to the aerial view and all four windows move as we zoom and pan. We also designed an image overlay viewer. This 1869 map of the uh, north coast of San Francisco City, North Beach. As we move the slider we can fade in the modern aerial view and see how the coves filled in over time. Or we can use the swipe view and swipe the map from left to right and see the same kind of change. We also put all of our maps in the ECHI time map search interface, a whole other kind of GIS. We did a rough georeferencing of about 10,000 of the maps, just locating the four corners. You can search for the maps in ECHI's viewer, bring them up. These are maps of South America, and you can find everything by geographical uh, place. Our next exploration was the creation of a 3D GIS. First, with desktop applications. Shown here taking this map of Yosemite Valley from 1883 that's all around us now in Second Life. As we zoom into it you can see the wonderful hachuring they used to indicate the cliffs and here it is now georeferenced. We were then able to take the georeference map and combine it here with a digital elevation model of the valley, all the heights. And this little animation shows how we sh literally stretched the Yosemite map across the digital elevation. Here we created a web page with a little flash preview and we were able to build using gaming software this 3D view now of Yosemite Valley. Disseminate this over the web. This is still on our website. You can zoom in, rotate, spin the valley around and even combine it with modern layers. Then we put it in to Google Earth. We're actually opening this up this month. Now we can see the Yosemite map in the Sierra Nevada in a, in a much broader context. We have the digital elevation model built into Google Earth. We can do transparency we can zoom in and then tilt and move through the valley. Then we did what we see all around us now. We brought this entire map into Second Life where you can fly through it. Jason and the team at Centric used the digital elevation model with a lot of hard work to create this wonderful landscape that's quite extensive and broad. And this is a whole new application of a 3D GIS with historical maps. Late in 2006, I created a public historical map layer in Google Earth which is now in the gallery layer called Rumsey Historical Maps. We started with 16 historical maps. The first one was the Cassini 1790 globe and we're going to add another hundred uh, just later this month, actually 104. This allows for all the tools of Google Earth and its growing layers of content to be seen with the historical maps and explored in various ways. Here are some examples. This wonderful Eagle Map of the United States from 1833, San Francisco from 1853, the built city in black. Then we can turn on the 3D building layer in Google Earth and see the modern city in relation to the old city. Africa, 1787, Tokyo, 
1680, three maps of the West Indies from 1775, a map of Seattle from 1890, various maps of Europe from the 18th century, a map of Lima, Peru from the 1860s, and another map uh, from Japan, a map of Kyoto from the 1700s, Tokyo from the 19th century. And here we can see all the maps now the, that'll total 120, shown with these little icons, uh, and how they're placed around the Earth. Google Earth hosts all kinds of information layers from worldwide sources. Here's the 1836 map in Google Earth of New York City. Then we can turn on the street layer, the 3D building layer, as we did in San Francisco. We can turn on the Wikipedia layer that they've just added, Google Book Search, the Google Community layer, and on and on. Panoramio layer. And we can also look at zip codes, and then we can fade into other historic map layers. Ending in this 1865 map, we can do measurement. Here's using their measurement tool, we measure the area. In 1836, it was 17.71 square miles with a perimeter of 26.64. Then we put that same shape file on top of the modern city and we can see how it's grown. They even have a cloud layer now in Google Earth and we can enjoy looking at the cloud sort of whimsical but on top of Henry Popple's 1733 map of North America. Finally, Google Earth is moving towards doing uh, through SketchUp various kinds of virtual reality. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge on top of my 1915 map of San Francisco. We can fly in Google Earth across the Pacific Ocean and come into Beijing on this 1930 map and look at a buildup of Tiananmen Square. So Google Earth is moving towards more kinds of virtual reality. It'll be interesting to see how this evolves. This spring we're also going to be adding the same 120 historical maps that are in Google Earth to Google Maps using their very robust API and working with a group in France called GeoGarage. This is the Cassini map of France from 1750 in Google Maps. So in this new space a map is not just a map. It can have many identities that will connote different aspects of its core meaning. I want to show two detailed examples of how historical maps can be transformed again and again by software. This 1733 map by Henry Popple of, the, of North America, and then we'll look at three maps of New York City from the 19th century. Looking first at the Henry Popple, we see it in the Luna application. This is one sheet in, of the 20 sheet map in the Popple Atlas. We can look at that atlas by opening the QuickTime panoramic views of my library and turning and see the atlas in book form in my library. We can then click on that in the QuickTime VR. It's hot linked and it goes into the Luna application and opens up the map. We can zoom into it. Looking at the map in the Luna application itself, we can see all 20 sheets of the atlas. We can look at them in the workspace separately, then we can combine them into one composite map. This map is 2 gigabytes in size, was one of the largest maps we put online. We can zoom in and then we can start doing a mashup of other maps that relate to it from different time periods and different kinds of views. Finally, we take that Popple map and put it on ESRI's Arc Globe. Now we can see it in a global context. It has yet another kind of meaning. We do transparency, see whether it's accurate or not in various areas. 
and no longer being limited to just straight on zooming and panning we now are more in a virtual world where we can fly over the map going up the east coast of the United States to the area around New York and then going over to the headwaters of the Mississippi River and going down the Mississippi crossing over Old St. Louis to New Orleans and the Delta and then spaceship like moving up again and rotating the map back to where we started. So that we've put into second into sorry Google Earth so that it's publicly accessible. Uh, let's look at a second example. Here's the Colton 1836 that's above us in Second Life in the Luna application. You can compare it to the 1852 map by Drips and the 1865 map by Eichberg Vili showing all the water courses. In Luna we see them very faithful to the original. We can look at them in appropriate scale next to each other. We can zoom in and see them coming into Murray, the Murray Hill area here. We see them in a manner very faithful to the original. Now we move into Arc IMS, a GIS, and in the quad viewer we can see all three maps now, same scale, same orientation along with the aerial view of New York. And then finally, let's see the three maps in Google Earth. 1836, 1865, and 1852. We can overlay the highways, we can twist them, we can turn them, see them in relation to Long Island, and we can do transparency moving from the 52 to the 65 to the 1836, and then to the aerial view, the satellite view of Manhattan Island. Now here we are in Second Life, the latest iteration, yet another way of looking at this map, and to me this is very exciting. We can actually take this map and with our avatars we can stand on it. We get the real sensation of standing. Here I am down at the battery, I've walked all the way uptown, I'm moving to the distributing reservoir which is the site of the New York Public Library, And I have a whole other way of looking at this map. It feels enormous to me. I can fly up over it and then drop down onto the world map that is at the front of the Welcome Center. This transformation continues here in Second Life where we offer wonderful ways to experience these maps in a new form. The scale is huge. We have maps stretched out over four sims and extending hundreds of meters up into the sky. The experience can be shared with others. You can add your own not notations on the world map that we just crossed over and comments. And You can take away over 50 maps, viewers, and globes to your own places in Second Life and pass them on to others. So Second Life offers all the elements of a digital library, plus importantly, it's a place to fly over and into the maps and walk on the maps and get to know them in a whole new way. I think the quality of the build here is a real tribute to Centric and its team. They've taken a great deal of care in crafting this world. I look forward to working with them on several new projects we'll try here, bringing more maps into the island and showing them in new ways. I'm excited that we'll be able to redefine what a map library is and can be right here on these map islands. Cartographers have long used globes as a means of comprehending the world in one view and the heavens. Here's a pocket globe from 1731 with the heavens in the case. This thing is about three inches in diameter and we can see the whole celestial sphere. Here's the modern version of the pocket globe. Google Earth and Google's sky with the celestial globe around it. The computer version is a similar kind of pocket reality in that it's portable and self-contained, yet it also expands itself through linking, sharing, turning, combining, and all the things we've been looking at. Virtual globes such as NASA's WorldWind, Google Earth, Microsoft's Virtual Earth, ESRI's Arc Globe, and here seeing 
the globes in the virtual world of Second Life, all these virtual globes will play a very large role in our view of what mapping is and how GIS advances. The special reality of working with these globes in Second Life is very compelling to me because it adds human scale so well, as we can see looking at Map Darwin exploring the globe spaces on this island. Virtual globes will be part of the growth of mapping services that will include public GIS access, 3D buildings, virtual worlds, tools to create maps and to annotate maps online, and the building of Web 2.0 digital map libraries made by users in a kind of geo wiki. To conclude, for me, one of the most interesting directions of GIS and maps, looking ahead to the next decade, is the fusion of 3D GIS, virtual globes, and virtual reality spaces, a kind of second Earth. Inside such a space is my map avatar, Map Darwin, sitting here on the orrery, looking at the celestial globe transformed by GIS, inspired originally by Google Earth and Sky, and now made superscale in Second Life. I think the creator of this celestial globe over 200 years ago in Rome, Giovanni Cassini, would agree that digital technologies have indeed given his marvelous work truly a second life.